Hi guys. It is a lovely rainy night here in New York, baby. On this, I think it is 52 degrees Fahrenheit right now. I guess it's 52 degrees Celsius on some places in the planet. Here on this lovely Wednesday, I, where are we? Somewhere around June 14th, 2023. <clears throat> so anyway, guys, some of you might know I read an excellent uh, essay by uh, lefty journalist Chris Hedges today called Requiem for Our Species, and I highly suggest... Uh, you listen to that. It is an excellent uh, essay. And for people, I guess, uh, not understanding, I am a huge fan of Chris Hedges, uh, okay? Uh, because Chris Hedges has done an about face on uh, overpopulation uh, since having two more children. Uh, yeah. And, and yeah, it's and of course becoming a vegan, having two more children, and and becoming a vegan, uh, he is no longer talking about population. That does not mean I still do not have a lot of respect for Chris Hedges. I mean, the the dude realizes how screwed he and his children are. Uh, the guy, I, I, I can imagine what Chris Hedges feels like in his private moments, realizing that uh, he was hoodwinked into uh, having more kids. It's always the girl's fault, right? Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, I mentioned at the end of that essay, Requiem for our species, which never mentions, obviously, never mentions the word overpopulation. And I don't even think anywhere in that long, excellent essay you will hear uh, the word population. Of course, you know, since he turned vegan in 2014, you know, he talks about how uh, animal agriculture uh, is the biggest threat to the planet uh, since, I guess, overpopulation no longer is. But anyway, <clears throat> I mentioned in there that Chris Hedges, I know that Chris Hedges at one time wrote uh, the best essay on overpopulation I've read anywhere, and unbelievably, you can still find it uh, online. I just put in Chris Hedges' article on overpopulation, and it popped right up. This is back when uh, <clears throat> Chris was still working for Truth Dig, and so I'm a little unclear. Uh, if you try to find out how many times Chris Hedges has been married, how many children he has, when did he marry his second wife, you will find all sorts of wild guesses uh, on, uh, <clears throat> on the internet. So on his own website, which of course he wrote, all he says is that he is now married to this Chinese woman named Eunice Wong, and they have two children, and he has two children from a previous marriage. That's all he says. I cannot find anywhere. Would somebody please help me, this old investigative journalist, and find out what year did Chris Hedges Mary Eunice Wong. My guess, it was sometime between 2009 and 2014. So I don't know when he wrote this article in 2009. I know that he has three biological children and he adopted the fourth kid. So I don't know if he and his first wife had one 
kid and adopted another one or if he and his first wife had two kids and then he married Eunice and they had one more. I think what it is uh, is that he and his first wife had one kid and adopted another kid and uh, then he wrote this uh, excellent article in 2009, met this Chinese woman 20 years younger, 19 years younger than he was, uh, and ended up marrying her and had two more children, I believe. But anyway, and then of course he turned vegan in the year 2014, as he mentioned. So we're going to read this article. And I'm going to come back and talk a little bit about militant vegans and, of course, uh, of course, breeders and overpopulation. But let's hear from Chris Hedges, father of one, maybe two, in 2009, March 9th, 2009, writing for uh, where he used to write for Truth Dig before all of that shit went down. In this excellent article, we are breeding ourselves to extinction, and I love the irony. You cannot uh, <laughs> resist the, the irony of a picture of three Chinese women uh, holding babies. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder if one of these women is the woman he married. I wonder if they're one of these. Anyway, take it away, Chris. We are breeding ourselves to extinction. All efforts to save the planet will be useless if we do not cut population growth by 2050. By 2050, the planet will have between 8 billion and 10 billion people, according to a recent UN forecast. Actually, Chris, you were off by 28 years. Uh, we hit 8 billion in 2022. And yet, studies, books, and documentaries that deal with various crises. Huh fail to discuss the danger of all those billions of hungry people looking for a better life. And of course, nowhere in that long, excellent article uh, that I read today, Requiem, for a species talking about climate change and animal agriculture, blah, 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 will you see the word population or overpopulation. Hmm. It failed to discuss. Chris Hedges has completely failed to discuss the danger of all those billions of hungry people looking for a better life. Okay. So now let's get into the actual body of this excellent article from 2009. <clears throat> Explain this to us, Chris. All measures to thwart the degradation and destruction of our ecosystem will be useless if we do not cut population growth, says the father of one or two before becoming the father uh, three or four. Anyway, by 2050, if we continue to reproduce at the current rate, the planet will have between 8 billion and 10 billion people, according to a recent UN forecast. This is a 50% increase, and yet government commission reviews, such as the Stern Report in Britain, do not mention the word population. Books and documentaries that deal with the climate crisis, including Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth, or Chris Hedges' Requiem for Our Species, fail to discuss the danger of population growth. This omission is odd. Hmm. 
given that a doubling in population, even if we cut back on the use of fossil fuels, shut down all our coal burning power plants, and build seas of wind turbines, will plunge us into an age of extinction and desolation unseen since the end of the Mesozoic era, 65 million years ago, when the dinosaurs disappeared. Huh. We are experiencing an accelerated obliteration of the planet's life forms. An estimated 8,760 species die off per year because, simply put, there are too many people. Huh. Most of these extinctions are the direct result of the expanding need for energy, housing, food, and other resources. I guess the two kids that he had uh, after meeting Eunice do not need energy, housing, food, or other resources. I think his newest kids are breatharians. The Yangtze River Dolphin, Atlantic Gray Whale, West African Black Rhino, Merriam's Elk, California Grizzly Bear, Silver Trout, Blue Pike, and Dusky Seaside Sparrow are all victims of human overpopulation. Population growth, as E.O. Wilson says, is, quote, the monster on the land. Species are vanishing at a rate of a hundred to a thousand times faster than they did before the arrival of humans. If the current rate of extinction continues, Homo sapiens will be one of the few life forms left on the planet, its members scrambling violently among themselves for water, food, fossil fuels, and perhaps air until they too disappear. Humanity, Wilson says, is leaving the Cenozoic, the age of mammals, in entering the Eramozoic, the age of solitude. As long as the Earth is viewed as the personal property of the human race, a belief embraced by everyone from born-again Christians to Marxists to free market economists, we are destined to soon inhabit a biological wasteland. Hmm. Except for the future children being born by Chris Hedge's new wife, the populations in industrialized nations maintain their lifestyles because they have the military and economic power to consume a disproportionate share of the world's resources. The United States alone gobbles up about 25% of the oil produced in the world each year. These nations view their stable or even zero growth birth rates as sufficient. It has been left to developing countries to cope with the emergent population crisis. India, Egypt, South Africa, Iran, Indonesia, Cuba, and China, whose one-child policy has prevented the addition of 400 million people, <clears throat> have all tried to institute population control measures, but of course they, you know, all of those have gone out the window since 2009. But on most of the planet, population growth is exploding. The UN estimates that 200 million women worldwide do not have access to contraception. The population of the Persian Gulf states 
along with the Israeli-occupied territories, will double in two decades, a rise that will ominously coincide with precipitous peak oil declines. The overpopulated regions of the globe, which apparently do not include Princeton, New Jersey, where Chris Eunice and his three or four kids live. So outside of Princeton, New Jersey, the overpopulated regions of the globe will ravage their local environments, cutting down rainforests and the few remaining wilderness areas in a desperate bid to grow food. This is Chris Hedges talking about planet nibbling. And the depletion and destruction of resources will eventually create an overpopulation problem in industrialized nations as well. The resources that industrialized nations consider their birthright will become harder and more expensive to obtain. Rising water levels on coastlines, which may submerge coastal nations such as Bangladesh, will disrupt agriculture and displace millions who will attempt to flee to areas on the planet where life is still possible. The rising temperatures and droughts have already begun destroy, to destroy croplands in Africa, Australia, Texas, and California. The effects of this devastation will first be felt in places like Bangladesh, but will soon spread within our borders. Footprint data. Footprint data, talking about ecological foot, footprint data, suggests that based on current lifestyles, the sustainable population of the United Kingdom, the number of people the country could feed, fuel, and support from its own biological capacity is about 18 million. This means that in an age of extreme scarcity, some 43 million people in Great Britain would not be able to survive. Overpopulation will become a serious threat to the viability of many industrialized states the instant the cheap consumption of the world's resources can no longer be maintained. This moment may be closer than we think. A world where 8 billion to 10 billion people are competing for diminishing resources will not be peaceful. The industrialized nations will, as we have done in Iraq, turn to their militaries to ensure a steady supply of fossil fuels, minerals, and other non-renewable resources in the vain effort to sustain a lifestyle that will, in the end, be unsustainable. The collapse of industrial farming, which is made possible only with cheap oil, will lead to an increase in famine, disease, and starvation, and the reaction of those on the bottom will be the low-tech tactic of terrorism and war. Perhaps the chaos and bloodshed will be so massive that overpopulation will be solved through violence, but this is hardly a comfort. James Lovelock, an independent British scientist, who has spent most of his career locked out of the mainstream, warned several, warned several decades ago that disrupting the delicate balance of the earth, which he refers to as a living body, would be a form of collective suicide. The atmosphere on earth, 21% oxygen and 79% nitrogen, is not common among planets, he notes. These gases are generated and maintained at an equable level for life's processes by living organisms themselves. 
oxygen and nitrogen would disappear if the biosphere where it was destroyed. The result would be a greenhouse atmosphere similar to that of Venus, a planet that is consequently hundreds of degrees hotter than Earth. Lovelock argues that the atmosphere, oceans, rocks, and soil are living entities. They constitute, he says, a self-regulating system. Lovelock, in support of this thesis, looked at the cycle in which algae in the oceans produce volatile sulfur compounds. These compounds act as seeds to form oceanic clouds. Without these dimethyl sulfide seeds, the cooling oceanic clouds would be lost. This self-regulating system is remarkable because it maintains favorable conditions for human life. Its destruction would not mean the death of the planet. It would not mean the death of life forms, but it would mean the death of Homo sapiens. And then, of course, we have this. James Lovelock advocates nuclear power and thermal solar power. The latter, he says, can be produced by huge mirrors mounted in the desert, such as those in Arizona and the Sahara. He proposes reducing atmosphere carbon dioxide with large plastic cylinders thrust vertically into the ocean. These, he says, could bring nutrient-rich lower waters to the surface, producing an algae bloom that would increase the cloud cover. But he warns that these steps, in, in addition to being hopium-soaked, you, you know, completely ridiculous, will be ineffective if we do not first control population growth. He believes the Earth is overpopulated by a factor of about seven as the planet overheats, and he believes we can do nothing to halt this process. Overpopulation will make all efforts to save the ecosystem futile. Lovelock in The Revenge of Gaia said, that if we do not radically and immediately cut greenhouse gas emissions, the human race might not die out, but it would be reduced to a few breeding pairs. The Vanishing Face of Gaia, his latest book, which has for its subtitle, The Final Warning, paints an even grimmer picture Lovelock says a continued population boom will make the reduction of fossil fuel use impossible. If we do not reduce our emissions by 60%, something that can be achieved only by walking away from fossil fuels, the human race is doomed, he argues. Time is running out. This reduction will never take place, he says, unless we can dramatically reduce our birth rate. All efforts to stanch the effects of climate change are not going to work if we do not practice vigorous population control overpopulation and times of hardship will create as much havoc in industrialized nations as in the impoverished slums around the globe where people struggle on less than two dollars a day. Population growth is often overlooked or at best considered a secondary issue by many environmentalists but it is as fundamental to our survival as reducing the emissions that are melting the polar 
ice caps. Thank you, Chris Hedges, in the year 2009, the meat-eating uh, father of one or maybe two, uh, and then he met this chick 19 years younger than him, and he wanted that nookie, uh, the old fart wanted that nookie, and there was one way he was going to get it. And all talk of population, overpopulation, went right out the window, and then five years later, he becomes a vegan, and all of a sudden, animal agriculture is the single biggest threat facing the planet, and you will not see the words population or overpopulation ever mentioned by Chris Hedges again. And, and this guy's, you know, all these charges, and uh, it, yeah, it, that Chris Hedges is a hypocrite. You know, I, this whole thing about calling anybody a hypocrite, okay, we are humans. We are hypocrites. It's easy for me to talk about overpopulation and breeders because I am not a breeder. Because I got a vasectomy at age 22 and am not a breeder and did more in, in, in 10 minutes getting that vasectomy. I did more to reduce my ecological footprint on this planet uh, than any vegan uh, on the planet uh, ever born, but I still eat meat. I don't eat beef or seafood, uh, but I still eat pork and chicken. I am a hypocrite. Uh, you, you know, if, if I uh, can't stop eating meat, uh, I, I set myself up as an example to, to sit there and, and call somebody that you're not going to pay any attention to anything anybody says. Chris Hedges is one of the great minds on this planet. Uh, obviously, he, is, he has been blindsided by Nookie. That if he hadn't met this chick 19 years younger than him, uh, wanting uh, to have kids, uh, he would still be talking about overpopulation as the biggest threat to the planet. He probably would not be a vegan. Uh, I don't know. My guess is that she led that uh, too. So uh, anybody, you know, looking at somebody because they're a hypocrite uh, on something that they don't practice what they preach or whatever, and you throw out all the baby with the bathwater. Every one of you uh, calling Chris Hedges a hypocrite, you're a hypocrite. And, and somewhere in your life, humans are hypocrites. I'm a hypocrite. Chris Hedges is a hypocrite. Humans are hypocrites. This is a fact. Deal with it. You are a hypocrite because you are a human. Uh, but anyway, and I just wanted to, uh, while we're on this, uh, of course, my, my good buddy Mark J., who I've mentioned here before, uh, Mark J., you know, he and I have been having a friendly debate Mark J. is one of these uh, self-described militant vegans. I need to make sure this camera is still on since there's no way for me to tell from the front of the camera whether it's still on. So Mark J. is uh, one of these self-described militant vegans. Uh, but somehow Mark J., the reason I love this man is... Uh, he is the only militant vegan that I know who is not a self-righteous militant vegan. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, I don't have time to read it because his comment 
is uh, as long as that essay by Chris Hedges after the uh, after the the essay I read today uh, from Chris Hedges. Uh, Mark, uh, as he usually does, whenever I I uh, suggest that animal agriculture is not the biggest threat to the planet, but overpopulation is, I can always expect a long comment from Mark J. And good Lord, he has gone. So anyway, I encourage you to read this. Anyone who doesn't understand how a militant vegan cannot be a self-righteous vegan. Mark J. is the only militant vegan. Uh, so this was my comment and my broken record comments for people who don't know uh, my own opinion on, uh, on, on veganism. Okay, this is my comment back to Mark, which he's heard a thousand times before. A person who is never born will never eat one scrap of meat or plants either. Since you, unlike Chris Hedges, are not a clueless moron and therefore you are not a breeder, I can't have any fun with you on this issue. I have had, I have said since day one, this is what I have said since day one, since I went onto YouTube, that I am not a vegan because obviously I am not spiritually advanced enough to refuse to eat my fellow earthlings. I don't eat beef or seafood, so at least I have that, have my line in the sand there. I do eat pork and chicken because they taste good, they are convenient, they are cheap, and most importantly, someone else gets to kill the pigs and chickens. Hmm. <clears throat> As I was admitting to a vegan staying at my place this weekend, if I had to actually kill the animals I eat, I would be a vegan tomorrow. I have also been saying since day one, and I still say this as I have not gone off the mark one bit, that a vegan with one child is responsible for a hell of a lot more damage to this planet than a non-breeder carnivore with no children. There is nothing any vegan, especially a CFM vegan with three or four kids such as Chris Hedges will ever say to me to convince me otherwise. The planet thanks you for being a non-breeding vegan. Now, if you would just stop driving that gas-sucking truck, brother, you could be right up there with Andy the Gardener and Ariel the Doomer Astrologer to win the Doomer Trifecta. I am off to stuff my face with a pork and chicken corn dog. And that is exactly what I did after leaving that comment. I went and had two uh, corn dogs made of factory farmed pork and chicken. Uh, and then part and, and you know part of Mark's long comment was talking about slaughterhouses. I think Mark is aware. Uh, I've told this story elsewhere in the Doomosphere. I actually worked at a chicken slaughterhouse where we slaughtered and butchered 82,000 chickens every day. I actually worked there for 10 days. My job was to ram my hand up the freshly killed 
chicken's ass and grab the uh, gizzard between my two fingers and yank it out of the chicken's butt. And uh, I took my five years of college. I actually made it 10 days working in that uh, chicken slaughterhouse, sloshing around with blood and guts uh, up to my ankles and blood running down my arm all day. And I remember my vegan friends saying, well, that will be the end of Sam eating meat to go work in a, in a chicken slaughterhouse. Well, I worked there 10 days. I'm not the one who killed the chicken. I just, uh, just yanked the gizzard out of a dead chicken's ass 82,000 times a day. Uh, and, and I would stop and, uh, and, and get me a thing of fried chicken on the way home every night. It, it did nothing uh, on any level to get me to stop eating chicken, to work at a chicken slaughterhouse. 82,000, so 820,000 chickens we killed and butchered in the 10 days I was uh, working there. And I love chicken probably more today than I did then. So I guess I am a hypocrite. And I will get into this whole thing. I'm not going to get into this whole thing. People act like there's no difference between a damn domestic chicken uh, and uh, I, I, I don't know, an Atwater's Prairie chicken. Uh, that, that whole clueless moron argument uh, that there's no difference between a damn chicken uh, and a blue whale. Come on, uh, don't, don't insult my intelligence. But that's another rant for another day. Anyway, uh, I gotta wrap this up because I have to. I have a sweet tooth, and I gotta go get some of that uh, factory farmed dairy ice cream. Get out there and enjoy your factory farmed dairy ice cream while you still can. Bye, guys. It is still running.